Hi, we defined the term protocol in the last video as a set of rules for transferring data. And there are a number of specific protocols you've got to know about for GCSE. We're going to cover them all in this video, apart from Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and Ethernet, which will come in the next video. There are quite a few, so buckle up. The first protocol is kind of a, a two in one here. TCP slash IP is how this is written. These are the two main protocols used by the Internet, but they are two separate protocols. So TCP, first of all, stands for Transmission Control Protocol. What it will do when it's sending data, it splits the data into individual packets. As we talked about, packets can travel down different routes as they're being sent. And so when they arrive at the destination, they might not be in the same order they were sent in. So when receiving packets at the other end, TCP will reassemble the packets back into the original data. And if a packet isn't received in a set time period, TCP requests that it is retransmitted because it must have been lost in transit. There must have been some error, maybe a data collision. IP stands for Internet Protocol. Its most well-known job is to assign IP addresses to the devices connected to the network. Now, IP addresses are so important that they're going to get their own video a bit further down in the playlist. A second job which IP does is do some route calculations. It will determine the best route for the packets to travel through. And it will be running on a router because really it's the router that has to decide what route to send the packets along. So the internet will use IP for sure. TCP does have a couple of alternatives, but most often we are using TCP with IP, which is why both often get lumped together as TCP slash IP. Now, there are many protocols can get subbed in and out depending on your task. If you are browsing websites, you'll be using either HTTP or more likely HTTPS. This stands for a hypertext transfer protocol and VS stands for secure. Oh, there's going to be quite a few acronyms to come and all of these you've got to try your best to learn. Now, these both are used for transferring web page data between a web browser and a web server. So if web browser acts as the client, it sends a request message to web server, web server processes this message and responds. And the request will most often be for web page code because that web server will have the web page code hosted on it, as we've talked about in a previous video. But also we could be requesting to send data to a server. For example, if I'm logging in to a server, I'm giving it data. It's not giving me stuff back necessarily. The key difference between these two versions of HTTP are HTTPS encrypts all messages. That's why it's secure. Now we'll look at encryption a bit more in the cybersecurity topic. But encryption means that if these packets are intercepted, they won't be easily understood by an attacker. And pretty much all traffic now is done via HTTPS because you might as well, even if what you are doing is not necessarily the biggest security risk, we still would rather an attacker not see what we're up to. This keeps it relatively private. If you were using HTTP to say log into a website, someone intercepting that message could see your password, could see your username. Now, FTP is maybe a little bit outdated. You probably won't use FTP most likely. I've only used it once or twice in my life. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. As the name would suggest, it's used to transfer files, but specifically to and from servers. So that's why it's not as common for people to have used it in their own experience. HTTP is normally there to transfer viewable content via a web browser, like a web page, whereas FTP is there to transfer these larger files directly from the server. So to give you some examples of where FTP might actually be used, let's say a web developer wanted to upload their completed website code and files to the web server. That could be quite a lot of data to send in one go. They might use FTP to transfer all of this in one go to the web server. Another example could be if a file server is holding a large amount of backed up photos, maybe quite a few terabytes of content, you would probably use FTP to transfer these back to your home computer as opposed to using HTTP. However, if you were, say, downloading a program from a downloads page, which all of us have done at some point, that will likely use HTTPS, which can also transfer files, albeit usually on the smaller end. So when we're thinking about server to server or a large amount of data being transferred, it's FTP. Otherwise, it's often just HTTP. OK, now there are three email protocols to round out this video. So maybe state the obvious emails get both sent and received, and there are different protocols for either of these jobs. 
Focusing on sending emails, there's actually only really one option for sending emails, which is SMTP. This stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Okay, so here is a typical email. I'm sending it to recipient at gmail.com. It's coming from me, sender at outlook.com. The two relevant servers here are Gmail and Outlook. My mail server is Outlook, but eventually it's gonna to go to Gmail's mail server because that's where my recipient's email is based. LSMTP is there to transfer the email from my computer to the mail server you are using. So its first job will be to transfer it from my computer to my mail server. Then it will transfer the email to the recipient's mail server. So Outlook will know the address of Gmail's mail server and SMTP does that second transfer as well. When we are sending emails, it's SMTP that actually transfers that message to the mail servers. So when I click send, it will eventually end up on Gmail's mail server, at which point another protocol will need to take over to actually download it to my recipient's computer. The two options are IMAP or POP. IMAP stands for Internet Message Access Protocol. POP stands for Post Office Protocol. I've given these not very subtle colors to represent which one's good and which one's bad. We generally use IMAP. POP is not really used as much anymore, and I'll explain why. So starting with POP, here is the recipient's mail server. There's an email sat waiting to be downloaded. When I open my email client, I will use POP to check for my emails. If there is an email, it will get sent via POP. Now the distinguishing factor about POP is, POP will transfer the original email and then delete it on the server immediately afterwards. So if there's an email waiting for me, it will get transferred via POP to my computer and the original is no longer on the mail server because POP is sort of done with it once it is downloaded to my computer. And so what this means is the email can't be re-downloaded. So if I go and check my emails on my phone, there'll be no messages available because the server is empty. So I can't view that email on another device, for example. And if I deleted it from my client computer, it would also be gone forever. As you'll know, from your own personal use, obviously you can check your emails on multiple different devices. So clearly POP isn't being used in most cases. Instead, we use IMAP. So what IMAP will do is it will only transfer a copy of the email and the server will keep the original. So if I go check my emails, IMAP is used to copy this message to my computer, but the server retains the original. And so it means I'd be able to also check emails on my phone and also read that on my phone as well. Now IMAP also keeps the server in sync. So the server, the server's copy, is kept in sync with my local copy. So if I do stuff like read the email, that would also transfer across to these other copies as well. If I move it to a new folder, that will also be reflected on other versions as well. So all of it's kept in sync, it's kept in touch, whereas pop is downloaded once and then goes. IMAP therefore is a little bit more convenient, especially if you have multiple devices.